Okay, welcome back. Uh, in this uh, short video, we're going to take a look at what kind of activation functions uh, can we use with steerable uh, neural networks. And obviously the choice for activation function is an important element of your uh, deep learning uh, architecture design. Uh, so let's see what can we do. Now, above all, we want that also these activation functions are equivalent, right? So they should commute with the representation of the fibers, because if my input is transformed, then in some way my fibers are transformed by the representation of the group. And so that means um, if the fiber is transformed and I apply my activation function, the same kind of information should be there uh, as if I were first to transform or apply this activation function and then transform the fiber via the representation. And maybe for consistency, I should have written an H because we often said that these fibers transform via the subgroup uh, elements uh, H. So I'm going to start off with an example of an activation function that we cannot use. So an incompatible activation function. What we're used to is applying a ReLU or a similar type of activation element wise. Um, but this we cannot do anymore in a steerable setting because now the vectors really represent vectors on which a representation can act. So they should be treated jointly and we should apply the ReLU not element wise, but let's say vector wise. And we'll see that in this example. So suppose we have this vector uh, at some location in my feature map, I apply the ReLU to it. Okay, what's happening? Nothing really. And then I rotate it and that gives me uh, this uh, blue vector, right? So, okay. Uh, apply activation function and then I'm rotated. So activation function and then rotate it. But what if I swap this order? So let's first rotate this vector. Okay, that moves it to the other side that generates this minus one zero vector. And then, then I do an element wise um, uh, ReLU. Okay, that maps it to the to the zero vector. And obviously this commutation diagram doesn't hold. So from, especially from the zero vector, I cannot yeah, I can rotate it whatever I want, but I will never recover this kind of vector. So obviously these pointwise activation functions are not allowed because they break equivariance. And I think this is really important. Like before we could really treat every element as an individual thing, but now we have chunks of, of vectors that transform via representation. So whatever we do, we should do it on the entire vector, not just on its elements. This only works if I have trivial representation, so a field of scalar values. Now then, here's an, a type of activation function that is actually allowed. Suppose, uh, yeah, again, I have this vector field of type one, so vectors that I can rotate with a rotation uh, matrix. Then what I'm allowed to do is I can have the activation function act on the norm or the length of these vectors. So I can um, first transform the length of this vector, okay, that scales it, and then rotate it, and that puts me uh, that brings me to this particular uh, vector. So I now apply this these steps of this commutation diagram. Now, if I alternate the order, so let's say I first uh, rotate the vector, I rotate the vector, then apply the activation function. Um, and here I must know that indeed rotating the norm of this rotated vector uh, stays the same, right? Uh, so the length of the vector is invariant to rotations. So we have this is this and this representation, I can move it uh, over there. That's, that's this one. So you already see that I'm able to write it in exactly the same form as this. And if I now uh, start uh, tampering with the length of this vector, I obtain the exact same result. So apparently I can do anything I want with the norm of this vector because that's an invariant uh, quantity. And this is what you would call a norm-based activation function. And this sigma is typically like a linear weight plus a bias. Um, and yeah, you know, and then sigma could be a ReLU or a sigmoid or a really uh, whatever I want. Okay, and th this was, I think, the, the active type of activation function first introduced in this uh, seminal paper, Harmonic Networks by uh, Daniel Worrell and, and co-authors, which we're going to cover in, in the next video. But the idea of this norm-based activation function was then further uh, utilized in, uh, in this paper, uh, which I also mentioned before, the steerable methods, which are referred to as gated nonlinearities. So what is happening here is that, okay, if we can mess with, with the norm, then or we can rescale these factors, then we can also just predict a scalar quantity that acts as a multiplier or as a gate to, let's say, keep this vector alive or not. So our neural network layer spits out the usual feature field like this.
uh, indicated with f hat, but simultaneously it also spits out a field of scalar values, which we're going to use as gating uh, values or gating multipliers. And again, since uh, scalar values transform uh, trivially, so if I were to first transform my feature field, I yeah, multiply my scalar value with one because this is a trivial representation, I uh, keep the, this, the same form. So anything I can do, anything I do on scalar values is allowed, but I cannot just simply mess with uh, the, the vectors uh, themselves. Okay, so these are referred to as gate nonlinearities, and it's a type of uh, nonlinearity non that affects the norm of the, the feature fields. And uh, please check out this reference um, if you want to learn a bit uh, more about them, but also a bit more about uh, Stubel and uh, neural networks in general. And then I want to get back to this idea of element-wise activation functions, because actually, um, not sure if I mentioned that before, but for these regular group convolutional neural networks, uh, activation functions really didn't pose an issue at all. And it has to do with the fact that there we use regular representations and regular representations uh, are just implementing a permutation of the elements in my vector. So they just move things around and therefore they are allowed. And that is illustrated in this figure. So what this shows uh, are three different types of visualizing this vector. And this vector could represent indeed the response of my uh, group convolution at a fixed position X and various uh, varying uh, rotation angles uh, alpha, right? So I really sampled all these discrete rotations and sampled their responses. We know that such functions, uh, and that's illustrated over here, right? So this is more uh, uh, another different visual uh, where on the circle we have the alpha axis and then relative to radius one, we have a higher, we have an increase, like that's this bump over here. Then we have a decrease, that's this bump, negative bump over here, and then all the way, and here we have another bump, that's this one, okay? Now we know that such uh, functions f of x transform by the regular representation. So that's just shifting the function over this alpha axis. And that is illustrated over here, we just sh shift the function. So let's go over this order. So we have a function, let's apply the activation function. It's happening here, right? So now we filter out all the negative values. That means we just set these values uh, that are negative to zero. And then shifting it around, it's just moving all this value to a different place in my vector. Like so, this is my activated uh, function. This is my shifted function. This is my activated function again. And this is the shifted function, right? So you, we see this kind of Mickey Mouse figure uh, rotating and also you, these responses shift uh, to the right. And so there's really nothing particular going on except for just shifting the data. So I could always do also do it like this. So I have my function, I'm going to shift it a little bit. It creates this a shifted version. So that's really a permutation of these values and then apply a ReLU, a clipping, only keeping the positive values. And obviously that gives me the same vector. So as long as I work with regular representations, I can use any activation function I want. All right, and what we've learned also so far is that we can map between the steerable feature fields uh, to the regular representations via these Fourier transforms. So uh, these type of activation functions are sometimes called, referred to as Fourier-based uh, activation functions. That is, if the core of the algorithm of the neural network is purely based on, uh, on steerable methods, so mapping from steerable feature type to steerable feature type, but you still want to use a nice pointwise activation function like a ReLU, then what you can do is you can do an inverse Fourier transform, apply your activation function, and then transform it back to this uh, steerable basis. Now, I do want to make a remark here is that if you have uh, this, this gray signal over here, and then you do a clipping, then this in induces these sharp transitions, right? That means high frequency. So actually, when you apply a pointwise activation function, you're actually inducing more higher frequencies. And but what is often happening is that you keep the, the number of frequencies fixed, uh, which means you throw out the higher frequencies that are caused by, uh, well, by these activation functions. And that's something that you don't have with the regular representations, uh, but with the Fourier uh, representation, you really um, maintain the strict band limit, let's say, of, uh, well, of the signals. But anyway, that, that does, shouldn't matter too much. It would create maybe some oscillations uh, here and there. But generally, these Fourier type activation functions or Fourier based activation functions, which maybe should actually be called inverse Fourier based activation functions, they tend to work uh, quite well. Okay, and then finally, I want to mention this class of tensor product based activation functions. They're kind of like squaring your function values, but then 
um, not in the regular sense, but because now we're working with vector or feature values. Uh, so we need to work with something called a Klebsch Gordon uh, tensor product. And that is something that they haven't covered yet, but now that we're talking about activation functions, I want to mention it uh, already. Um, so please have a look at these, these papers. Maybe they make more sense after a lecture three, once we looked into the 3D case, but there they introduced this idea of polynomial activation function. And this uh, O times, this tensor product can be thought of as really a multiplication. In the scalar case, it is actually a multiplication. And then these activation functions can be thought of as polynomial activation function, like a feature map to the power two, to the power three or uh, whatever. And then uh, in this paper, they go to a bit more detail in these type of uh, activation functions. But actually this paper is maybe more accessible at this uh, point in time. It focuses on 2D SO2 uh, activation functions. It's a really recent uh, paper on NURBS 21, um, where really they, they also make this connection to Fourier theory and what kind of activations you can and should use. And they have some very efficient and useful activations uh, defined in this paper. All right, so with this and the previous lecture in place, I think we've we've covered everything, uh, every intuition to, to start building your own group convolutional neural networks with these libraries based on, uh, well, steerable uh, group convolutions. So please go ahead, check out uh, the tutorial and start solving your problems with steerable uh, group convolutional neural networks.